And uh, the topic is challenge and opportunity of applying blockchain in services. Well, we know services is also a sort of application to serve the society, serve the mankind, and all area. And blockchain is a very ch promising technology, and uh, it's a very exciting, but we also know blockchain has some challenges in order to use it in terms like uh, overhead and the sp speed and so forth. But uh, the opportunity, very promising, especially in some special applications which use the advantage of a blockchain. And I know worldwide, blockchain research and application very, very popular and in <clears throat> almost everywhere because uh, there's a great potential. Now for this conference, of course, we focus on services and then this is a very important topic and uh, for our audience. And uh, today, we are very pleased to have uh, three distinguished panelists in their various uh, expertise address this issue. Well, before I introduce them, let me introduce myself. My name is Stephen Yao. Some of you probably already know me if you attend the last year Congress in San Francisco. I was the general chair for that conference, and I'm glad to see you again. And so that I, the conference uh, did very well, and this year and the next year we anticipate will continue to grow, primarily because computer, IT technology, getting growth, <clears throat> very grow, rapid growth in all direction in applications. Uh, I'm from uh, Arizona State University, and uh, so I'm not going to say more than that. You probably know me already. But uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the three distinguished panelists. The first one is Peter Chen. Peter, please uh, stand up. You probably know, uh, recognize him already. <laughs> this morning, during the opening session, he chaired the session and uh, introduced the keynote speaker. And uh, he had a very outstanding credential in computer science. His uh, uh, research, everybody know, in the database area entity, and uh, uh, what, this morning when you introduced him, uh, talk about his uh, various uh, outstanding accomplishments. Last year, he gave an outstanding tutorial on blockchain in San Francisco. And uh, very well attended, and uh, today he is going to go, not talk about tutorial, but to talk about much more advanced topic in terms of the advantage, disadvantage, and the f f inherent property of a blockchain, and uh, related to what challenges and opportunities we have for applying blockchain in services. Our second uh, panelist yeah, Dr. Andrew Klein, please stand up. <laughs> Currently, he is a technical manager uh, at Siemens in Munich, Germany, not too far away. He took train here, I understand. Uh, he come here quite often. He had a very extensive experience before he joined Siemens. He worked for IBM for 15 years and in the technical management area. So he's a very well known and very familiar with the center in the uh, uh, blockchain and uh, the application for the technical, all sort of a technical application. And uh, then the next uh, panelist is <clears throat> Dr. Yan Zhen. Yan? Yan Zhen, please stand up. She's also a professor 
uh, in Xidang University in China, as well as Alto University in Finland. She flew in this morning specifically for participating in this panel, and she had a very extensive experience in industry and received many patents. But the important part is not that she has many patents. I understand every patent she has have already been used in the industry. So that's the exciting part. And her area is in cybersecurity and the distributed system, decentralized management, and so forth. So you can see we are going to have a very exciting discussion. And first of all, we have the opening statement from these three panelists. And uh, first by Peter, and by Andrea, and then by Jen, uh, by Yen. Peter, you'd like to come up? Thank you. I think um, <clears throat> it's my honor to be here to share some of the idea with you uh, because I'm the first one, so I just give a very quick uh, overview of blockchain. And uh, basically, it's a distributed ledger, a value organized in a chain of blocks. And ledgers keep track of assets and uh, trades and transactions. So distributed means there are multiple copies in multiple locations. So that later we we'll talk about challenges, and that's also creating some of the challenges. The value, what are the values? The value could be something tangible, like the money, house, land, cars. Okay, so there are some intangible values, such as copyright, pattern, business brands. And uh, block is a collection of structure of transactions. Chain we call a blockchain. Chain is a link of the items, such as the blocks. Now, basically, there are a lot of development in this blockchain business. Certainly, the most well-known is the Bitcoin. And since that time, there's a, you know, thousands of different kind of coins developed. And uh, then there are people called miners, basically it's try to create the blocks and uh, also try to validate the block and signing off the block. Ledgers, basically, if you talk about a database term, it's a shared data. Then we have the open public, and uh, there are different ways to organize the blockchain. Either you open for everybody, or you just make it private, so you don't only concentrate on political organization. So then there are different ways to prove the work. Means how can you make sure uh, who can create a block and how can you provide an incentive to the block creators and validator. So there are two technology. One is called proof of work. The other is called proof of stakes. Okay. <clears throat> then there's something people talk a lot about is called smart contract. Basically, if some of you are familiar with the database terminology, is something similar to so-called stored procedures, means the computer procedure stored inside. <clears throat> so now we have the panel talking about challenges and opportunities. What I see, one of the major challenges is performance issue, because you know, it's, when we have a blockchain, a lot of chain getting together, so they are building up a huge chain, and it takes time to process that. So we need the faster, faster computer. So that takes a while to do that. Now, if you can certainly say computer getting faster, faster, but there's a competing between whether you have your very large blockchain and then you have the fattest computer in the world. So that's a big you know, type of challenge. So then the other thing is the number of distributed ledgers how many copies you should keep. Okay. Certainly, the more, the better, but there's a limit on that. Means 
If you distribute millions of copies, certainly you will run into more and more trouble. The performance will not be very good. So there's an optimum value of the distributed ledgers. Then the size of block, okay, how many transactions you put into a block. So that's the other things are privacy and uh, security. I think some of our panelists will talk more about that, is how to enhance and incorporate that into the system. And um, the other thing I would like to talk more is about this lack of trust in a blockchain system. In some way, some of you probably have, you know, attended the, this morning's keynote speech. So later on you can see what I try to preach here is very similar to the keynote speaker's idea because um, we, I believe, same as maybe in some way similar to uh, Dr. <coughs> Sikipas, his idea is basically uh, the trust. You know, the blockchain is very popular right now, but only in a small group of people. And uh, it's basically why it's not become very popular. The reason is because it's controlled and manipulated by a small group of people. Okay. And uh, so that's creating some kind of snow acceptance. What are the opportunities? One opportunity is the so-called trust issue. I just mentioned about that. I think some of you probably remember this morning, uh, the keynote speaker mentioned about different levels of trust. We'll talk more on here. The other is the design issues the trade-off between several design dimensions of blockchains and how to balance those trade-offs. Then the other thing is how can we match the needs and requirements to the design dimension. Okay. Then in the, look in the future, we need to develop some system, some technology to coexist, coexist integrate conventional system with the blockchain system. So the blockchain system will not take over the whole world. It will only take over part of the world. So we need to do that. Now, let me talk a little bit about what is the concept of trust. And then give an example of the trust. Then we talk more on the foundation of trust. So you might look at the dictionary definition. There are different definitions of trust. Basically, the noun talking about you trust a person, you have confidence, and you, have, you can sell mer merchandise on trust, okay, and you can create a trust, and God is my trust. The interesting thing is uh, if you, I think in Europe, probably in some way uh, similar to the you know, United States, but the United States more and more uh, in the way the culture is they don't trust the government as much as trusting God, okay? So when you can see all the person of the United States swear, they all swear toward the Bible, okay? But it, uh, there's a no confidence on the trust of the U.S. government as well as the congressmen, Congress people. Now, the, the example of trust, we look at the election system, voting system. So basically starting with raising our hands, and the paper voting, voice voting, polling, online voting. Now, this people try to get into the online voting, but it still become very, very sensitive. As you may remember, the, uh, about 10 years ago or longer, the, there was a big debate on Florida, you know, whether the, <clears throat> uh, the president should be uh, Al Gore or the, okay somebody else, so that's a big debate. Now, so how can we make the trust on that? Even you do the online pooling, okay, to, to make a pool on who will be the candidate. So the pooling could be very, very dangerous and sensitive, okay? Recently, I think in Taiwan, they are starting some kind, I think some of you come from Taiwan, there's a, some kind of a selection of particular political party candidate to, to see who will be the candidate. They're doing polling, telephone polling, and turn out to be 
uh, very complicated. Everybody worry could be some fraud there. So the, the trust is not there. The monetary system is another system of trust. Here are some of the money, the paper notes. Okay, some of you recognize that. So the one thing you recognize is more com confident. Now, if you look at history, basically started with something with value, like gold, silver. Then later become a paper. Okay, the paper, why do you trust the paper? Okay, and um, so because the reason we use it, because we trust the government, because we trust the, the notes are not fake, and we trust other people exchange with you, and we trust the exchange rate, okay, from the US dollar to the, uh, to the euro, or from the Chinese uh, RMB to the you know, euros. So the, when we do the changes, the exchange rate could be changed, but we assume the exchange rate will not be changed very fast. The other issue is where's your money? Is money in your pocket or in your cell phone or somewhere? And uh, so where we store the money? Then we deposit into the bank. So now there's also another issue is the bank run and inflation. Now it's here, some of the country probably run into here in Europe too. And uh, guys, in order to build up the trust, we need to do several things. So from this monetary system, we can learn some theory of how to build up a trust. One thing important is theoretically sound. You have to be sound uh, in your monetary theory. The other is you have to be proven by past successful experience. You know, every time we exchange money, we deposit money in the bank, next morning, two, two months later, we withdraw, the money's there, okay? Now, you don't, if sometimes it doesn't work that way, you are a little scared. The other thing is so-called fraud tolerance system. Means if something's wrong, you can recover that, okay? Or if somebody run into a bank, let's say everybody uh, went to a bank, tried to withdraw money, the bank may be bankrupt. So the government will come in to rescue that. So that's the fraud tolerance system. The other thing I think is important, it takes time to build up trust, okay? So those are the important ingredients for building up trust. For the blockchain system, we're still in a very early stage. So we have to go through this kind of step-by-step step to do that. Now. The next thing I would suggest is to, to look at the so-called level of trust. Remember this morning, the keynote speaker also mentioned different level of trust, different level of trust worthiness, worthiness. So the issue are how many levels? And uh, also the, which level? What's the precise definition? And uh, whether some of the level are overlapping with each other, whether they are contradiction with each other, so there's a lot of research can be done. The, the other thing is the trade-off. <clears throat> I think we are, when we people claiming the blockchain is very useful because it would, nobody can change it. But do we really want your one extreme? Things never change. On the other thing, things can be changed. Maybe something is a spectrum. Something can be changed. Similarly, just open system versus closed system, or maybe somewhere between. And so there's a lot of design parameters, variables, and then performance, speed, cost, human cost, equipment cost, everything. So there's a lot of design consideration. When we apply, what we try to see is in our services arena, let's say the health services, uh, or maybe the monetary services, so the monetary probably, the, you don't want things to change. The immutability is very important. But the performance may be a little slow, it's okay. Uh, you know, when you deposit money, it show up like a 10 minutes later or one hour later, it's fine. But it, you know, for certain other things, 
let's say in the health blockchain, health services, you, you, get, you go to see a doctor, you do a test of your heart, you get a report two days later, it's okay. So there's a different kind of consideration. So this is the last slide. The other thing is the coexistence and the integration with the existing system. Because we talk too much about just one type of system, blockchain, but I see that in the future, it has to be coexist with other system. Basically, not only coexist, we have to develop how to transfer data from one to the other. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello together, Andreas Kind here. So I hope my presentation will come. Or do I have to click in maybe? Somebody's controlling this from the back, is it? That looks good. So happy, thanks a lot for the uh, invitation to speak here on this panel. Um, and what I would like to do with, roughly within 10 minutes is to give you a little bit like a flavor of what it means to do blockchain in an industrial context. Um, and uh, th this is a sort of really interesting experience for myself too because I'm fairly new with Siemens. I worked for IBM, as mentioned before, for a long term. Uh, worked on very much the technology stack around blockchain. Um, and now I'm more in the applications and the industrial applications of blockchain. So what I, I would like to basically start off with um, letting you know that uh, Siemens is not about dishwashers, it's not about vacuum cleaners and these kind of consumer goods that maybe some people will associate with Siemens. But much more interestingly, it's about all these kind of industry. It's about uh, things like process integrations, process automation, factory automation, it's about energy networks and all kind of critical problems that arise in this context, it's about building, so the automation in buildings, uh, it's about mobility services, so many trains are actually built by, by Siemens, uh, and finally all the kind of urban infrastructure, so when you pass by like these gray boxes next to um, the, the, the roads that we have in the cities, very often it's, a, it's, a, it's Siemens technology inside. So you see these elements of critical infrastructures basically everywhere when you just look a little bit careful and very often it's uh, Siemens behind. behind. And um, my responsibility in Siemens is really to look after the cybersecurity technology, so technologies that go into uh, these infrastructures. And it, it's getting more and more um, not only interesting but actually um, are very challenging because things get connected. So in all these industry, there's a trend not only towards automation, but also towards more connectivity, digitization, digitalization as well, uh, which leads to big challenges. So you basically have the old world, the OT side, the operational technology side, uh, that has some control elements, some electronics in a, in a factory, for instance, in a, uh, a process control context. Uh, and then you have the IT uh, world. It's basically the internet and uh, the, the computers that you use every day. Um, of course, the um, enterprise part of IT as well that sits in the, uh, the companies. And these worlds, they, they basically connect now. So OT is typically you have uh, you know, some sensors or some control devices that are connected to a gateway. And there's a propriety protocol typically. But then these boxes in the past used to, so the gateways used to be isolated. So there was a sh basically a, a segmentation. And now these gateways get connected with the IT side. Uh, huge uh, potential there, of course, to connect these two worlds. But of course, things get opened up uh, for 
uh, problems around cybersecurity as well. And now we see also that there's a trend towards having these infrastructures not only within one company, with one, within one trust domain, but we see like more and more uh, opportunities where uh, processes actually cut across uh, trust boundaries, cut across company boundaries. And you could take, for instance, uh, Industry 4.0. So it's, uh, it's the idea that you have a very flexible way of manufacturing products um, where basically multiple companies work together. It's the, the supply chain is connected directly with the demand or the design with the... Uh, um, uh, the, the way you actually uh, produce where multiple companies are involved uh, with respect to the machinery. It's not only the maintenance part, it's also uh, the finance side that certain machineries are actually on lease and uh, you have the, the companies that lease these machines, they have to understand how they are used. So it's a, it's a very dynamic, very uh, like open environment more and more that you don't close up a factory but there are more, more and more different uh, companies involved, and this raises challenges. And I could uh, I could give you more examples. Uh, for instance, in the in the context of uh, 3D printing, where again you print something where the design comes from a different company. So how do you protect that only the number of copies of a particular design are taken um, according to the contract? How do you protect then the the design also during the manufacturing process? Can you put something into uh, the, the product or the part as it is sort of continue as it is as it is continuing on the way in the, in the supply chain so very interesting uh, questions that come in this context where you step outside the single trust domain context but you step into a multi trust domain context so now um, what does it mean for a company like Siemens or actually IBM pretty much the same way to do blockchain? And you have to be very aware of there, there are basically two routes, two paths. And I made it um, quite um, uh, sort of pronounced on, the, on this picture where you see basically a path that goes on the left-hand side here. It starts um, basically that you want to have some kind of fault tolerance uh, I think this, this really dates back decades uh, where people understand, okay, how can I have a, a distributed database without a single point of failure? How can I compute uh, without having one master, basically? So these kind of uh, fault-tolerance systems um, and the protocols around this, this is actually dates back really uh, quite a number of years. And then it, it, it starts, started also around decentralization, started around the fact that you want to have some form of public verifiability that a group of organizations or individuals would like to verify the, the correctness of a transaction without having one central organization uh, basically um, standing up for all, all these participants. But it's, it's really a fully distributed way of public verifiability. And at that point, you, you see basically how things fork. On the left-hand side, you see the systems that are more based on anonymity, where you really don't know who are uh, the individuals or the companies behind certain transactions, who are the, the nodes that verify, that commit transactions. So it's basically the, the Bitcoin route, um, pretty much the Ethereum route as well. It comes from a particular uh, libertarian mindset of, as well which leads basically um, to the idea of having very large networks because of the fact that it should scale in, a, in an un anonymous, anonymous context basically means the performance is not very, very good. So if you look at the throughput of, of Bitcoin, it's simply not uh, industrial grade, if you, if you could call it like this. Um, and it also leads to, uh, because it is so open to um, a very loose governance around uh, the software stack, the, the way that the networks are run and so on. But it's part of the, the idea. It, it's basically by design. And then you have on the right-hand side uh, more the industrial blockchain uh, design space where you, where you basically say, we need to know the identities right from the start based on these kind of certificates that, uh, that represent the, the, the companies, that the, uh, the individuals that transact. You can derive transaction certificates with which you can transact in the system anonymously. So you can have both. You can basically a strong form of identity, but you can achieve 
confidentiality as well as privacy at the same time. It's all based around the crypto that we have. It's a toolbox that is just being used here. Very important also, auditability. In many industries, we have regulatory bodies that need to audit certain processes. If you keep completely anonymous, it's not possible to do any kind of audit. So this is basically the right-hand side where uh, the networks, because of the fact that you know the participants, are also much smaller and then you can afford uh, consensus algorithms that scale much better. So actually this trade-off is just the other way around. So it's higher performance, but the scale is not as big. We don't need so many participants uh, and we have the benefit of using consensus algorithms around what is called uh, uh, between fault tolerant algorithms or in the more lighter trust version of uh, crash fault tolerant protocols. And they simply scale much better than uh, a proof of work system. And it also leads to a, a much stricter form of govern, gov, uh, governance where the participants can really agree on, on uh, the way these networks are run. And that's sort of basically the, the foundation. If you do industrial blockchain, or let's say enterprise blockchain, where you also think about the strong ecosystems uh, you, you might want to depend on or basically that you need to support basically on a sustainable way uh, a blockchain strategy, it can only be the right way. Uh, and you would find the big enterprises in the world more or less always following the right, the right path. So um, when doing research, and I was in a research organization before, and again, I'm uh, uh, sort of uh, leading the uh, cybersecurity research uh, from the technology side, as well as the blockchain for overall Siemens. Um, it makes sense uh, to sort of uh, go, go basically the vertical path. Uh, in IBM, I was more on the horizontal path, basically looking at a really sol solid stack for uh, an enterprise-grade blockchain system. But now, uh, it's a different uh, company, it has a different business model. It's, it's, it's uh, rooted in really strong industrial um, uh, expertise. Uh, the differentiation is really in this knowledge, in this industrial knowledge. And you saw at the beginning the different uh, areas where Siemens is active. So it's energy, it's buildings, it's uh, process automation, factories and so on. And so the work that uh, a company like Siemens is now doing is really around the industrial integration of blockchain services. And it has two sides. It has the edge integration, so when you think about factories, the devices that you have in a factory, for instance, or when you think a, a vehicle, how do you integrate blockchain in, or let's say, a client of a blockchain system into a vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, for instance, or a charging station, a tolling station, a boom gate, so all these automotive use cases. Or um, how do you integrate it um, in some, uh, you know, PCL, like, like a, a, you know, a, process control, electronic device, and so on. And then on the other side, on the top, it's more around the um, basically bridging the gap between uh, the people that need to implement a particular solution that have in their mind, so their terminology, their kind of um, thinking around the, the business processes, and the blockchain technology from a programmatic perspective, and typically there's a huge gap. So somebody who is not really, so let's, let me phrase it differently, somebody who wants to implement uh, a system in a particular industrial domain does not necessarily have to understand you know, how the, the crypto works and blockchain system, how the consensus works. So what we're looking at is what are the templates? What can be basically the very high level programmatic patterns in order to develop blockchain applications? And now I would like to give you two examples at the end. Um, so the first one is uh, around an IoT edge device. Uh, so Siemens builds quite a number of these. Um, it's uh, devices that uh, sit in all kinds of infrastructures. You see an example here on the top. It's an IoT 2040 gateway um, to which then would be other uh, sensors, for instance, uh, connected. Um, and the challenge is basically to have such a device integrated into a blockchain system. And a blockchain system typically has an access, um, um, access point uh, represented by a respective organization that 
is basically within the same trust domain uh, where the edge device would sit. Um, and it's basically about porting uh, a client, a blockchain client onto this edge device. And sometimes the space is not big enough here. So what has to be done is really to trim it down this client uh, stack to uh, the bare minimum, which is basically just signing a transaction. And this, the key that is used for signing the transaction has to be relevant in the context of uh, the identity services, the membership services of the respective blockchain system. Uh, and this brings a um, whole lot of issues with it um, because you have these, these field devices that they just sit out there. Uh, you don't know exactly who has access to them. Um, it's important to store the keys in a trusted environment um, to basically have them signing the transaction in a trusted platform execution module. Uh, and this is not, not straightforward. Sometimes these devices also don't speak the traditional uh, protocols like um, uh, TLS, for instance. So it's, uh, it's not straightforward, but this, this is one, one area we're working on. Then a second uh, example is around food processing. Um, and here we uh, see again like a bit of a gap where uh, uh, the many people think about, yeah, it's great if I could follow basically where my food comes from, uh, an orange juice or whatever you buy in a supermarket. Uh, but also um, in purchasing, you know, uh, when you have a hospital and they buy pharma products, for instance, they also have to really understand where, where do the products come from? Are they really the original ones? And very often um, this is uh, um, tried to, to solve by tapping into the ERP systems, basically the existing uh, system that maintain incoming goods, uh, outgoing goods, and, and how they are processed in a particular, in a particular organization. But the real challenge is to extend the trust into the physical domain. And the physical domain are really these kind of um, uh, machineries. It's like the food processing machinery where you know what goes into the, into the machinery, into the food processing machinery, or where you know what goes into a packaging uh, um, uh, uh, machine that, that basically wraps food or, or packages, packages the food. And Siemens is the company that very often um, equip the factories with the, uh, the process control system. So they, they look pretty much like this. And again, there's a gateway. So here's a, normally a proprietary protocol being spoken. And then it's connected to the IT infrastructure. And this is a, so a second example, basically, where we're currently working on to have these PLCs talk blockchain, basically, that they can be integrated into a blockchain system. And with this, it would be truly uh, a provenance system that would also extend the trust in, into the physical part of this, of this, of this picture. So with this, um, I, I, I close here, and I guess we have more questions later. Thanks a lot. Machine slow. Uh. 
Thank you very much for Professor Yao's invitation to join this uh, panel discussion. Uh, my talk is about uh, AutoSource. It's a blockchain-based system for autonomous uh, mobile cross-sourcing with decentralized uh, trust management. Uh, in my talk, I will introduce the background and the motivation of our work and specify open issues and the challenges of using blockchain to achieve decentralized trust management in mobile crowdsourcing. Then I introduce our working status and the current research result. Finally, I conclude my talk and indicate future opportunities. Uh, mobile crowdsourcing has emerged as an effective data collection method. It's kind of a service that can be offered by anybody uh, who would like to offer, who would like, who's capable of offering with regard to data collection, processing, and analysis. This uh, is benefit from the popularity of smart devices uh, like smartphones, wearable devices, and the fast development of mobile communication technologies such as uh, Wi-Fi connection and uh, 4G, 5G communication systems. Uh, mobile crowdsourcing holds uh, many advantages such as mobility, uh, flexibility, uh, scalability, cost uh, economy, and uh, human intelligence. Different uh, uh, from and compared with traditional wireless sensor networks, it has been widely applied into many domains and fields, such as uh, map com construction, environmental uh, monitoring, uh, smart city, uh, public safety, and so on. Although there are many advantages of mobile crowdsourcing, uh, it's still facing severe uh, problems with regard to security, privacy, and trust. Uh, the openness and the mobility of mobile crowdsourcing makes it easy to behave selfishly and uh, suffer, make the system suffer from all kinds of attacks. It concerns greatly, uh, especially on uh, privacy with regard to mobile workers who offer uh, collected data and also related to the uh, mobile data collection requesters. The nature of mobile crowdsourcing's uh, trustlessness uh, make data quality reliability hard to be guaranteed and uh, make fair exchange between mobile workers and uh, service requesters hard to be ensured. So I think the problems of uh, mobile crowdsourcing, security, privacy, and trust can be concluded as trust management of mobile crowdsourcing nodes, data, and uh, operational processes in order to realize autonomous uh, uh, task management, uh, data collection task management, uh, worker selection, uh, data collection, processing, analysis, and uh, uh, final result uh, provision to the uh, task requester. We have conducted a sort of, uh, sort of uh, survey on the, problem, uh, on the security, trust, and uh, privacy of mobile crowdsourcing. And we found that uh, most of existing uh, solutions is centralized. It depends on a uh, uh, trusted uh, service provider and this kind of design and solution could easily suffer from a single point failure and make the scalability of the whole system hard to be achieved. Blockchain as a promising technology for decentralization can help solve the centralized trust management solution in mobile crowdsourcing. It can help to solve the problem of a single point failure, ensure information consistency and trust can provide a trans Mm, traceability and public auditing, and uh, the advantage of a smart contract, which is a very important application of blockchain, can help automate uh, the autonomous processing of mobile crowdsourcing. However, uh, there are still a number of challenges with regard to trust management by using uh, blockchain into mobile crowdsourcing. First, the security and the efficiency of blockchain is hard to be uh, ensured. Current uh, blockchain technology suffer from high computational resource consumption, long transaction uh, confirmation time, low throughput, uh, facing a fork issue, and uh, many kinds of attacks, such as 55% uh, attack, eclipse attack, and so on. 
decentralization is actually hard to be ensured if a powerful party can control or master most of the resources in the whole system. Second, uh, multifaceted privacy preservation is hard to be guaranteed, in, hard to be achieved in mobile crowdsourcing in a decentralized context. This is because it will lack a trusted party to manage and store a secret confidential, uh, confidential for privacy preservation and the transparency of the blockchain contradict with uh, privacy protection. User anonymity conflict with uh, public auditing and the trust evaluation. In addition, the truth and the reliability of collected data it's actually hard, even harder to be uh, maintained or guaranteed in a decentralized context. Thus, I think uh, we cannot directly apply blockchain into mobile crowdsourcing in order to uh, maintain and uh, manage its trust. In order to uh, use blockchain to achieve decentralized trust management in mobile crowdsourcing, we need to answer three questions. First, how to design a secure and efficient blockchain system for mobile crowdsourcing trust management. Second, how to realize trust management with holistic privacy preservation. Third, how to extend trust behaviors of, of all functional nodes in mobile crowdsourcing and ensure data truth in a decentralized manner. We propose AutoSource. It is a blockchain-based uh, mobile crowdsourcing trust management system. We aim to achieve three goals in our project. First, decentralize the trust management based on blockchain. Second, achieve comprehensive privacy preservation with regard to node identity privacy preservation, node personal information privacy preservation, node related data privacy preservation, and at the same time achieve privacy preserving trust evaluation and privacy preserving data truth discovery. The third goal is about data truth discovery based on trust driven incentive. Our, de our research is based on different uh, security uh, trust model from traditional MCS model. In our system, no any centralized uh, trustworthy party exists. All nodes are rational and profit-driven. Nodes do not trust with each other, and uh, they try to make decisions based on the information recorded in the blockchain. In our system, they then, uh, Blockchain's consensus mechanics play an important and the core role in the whole uh, autosource system, which can provide the support on both task management and the trust management. Here, in due to time limitation, I focus on introduce the basic idea of our consensus uh, mechanics. Our consensus mechanics of autosource blockchain system contain two important uh, algorithms. One is for block generation, another one is uh, unique block uh, selection. Block generation is based on sufficient uh, collected uh, information regarding mobile cross-sourcing and at the same time involve anonymous trust evaluation into the block generation. And the block selection algorithms can uniquely select uh, a block in order to avoid the fork issue and uh, Mm, this selection is based on considering a block generation time, node trust value, as well as uh, node profit equilibrium. We evaluate our block uh, uh, chain system by considering both security and the performance. We use the following security evaluation metrics like uh, liveness, safety, fault tolerance, and decentralization to evaluate the safety uh, property of our system. Meanwhile, we consider uh, performance evaluation metrics as block generation time, transaction confirmation, latency, throughput, computational overhead, and the accuracy of our trust evaluation result. We conducted uh, proof of concept implementation based on both Windows operating system and Android system. And uh, in this window, you can see uh, we compare our system with a number of uh, uh, traditional blockchain system like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, uh, Primecoin, and Ethereum. Uh, from security point of view, we can see that our system can support decentralization and it has high fault tolerance rate. With regard to performance, 
our system uh, outperform uh, other systems with regard to uh, transaction confirmation latency, computational overhead, and uh, our block generation time is uh, quite okay. Uh, although our throughput is uh, a bit uh, lower than other systems, but it's uh, acceptable. And the communication complexity is the same level as other systems. So concluding my talk, I introduced the background motivation of our work about uh, autosource. It uh, uh, contains a novel consensus mechanisms to support uh, high security and efficiency. And also we embed the trust validation in blockchain generation. In the future, we uh, aim to apply advanced cryptography technology and a trust execution environment to break through uh, holistic privacy preservation in mobile crowdsourcing and achieve privacy preserving data truth discovery. Uh, meanwhile, we are going to design an incentive mechanism based on theor uh, game theoretical study and driven by trust in order to motivate trust behaviors in mobile crowdsourcing. Thank you. Well, thank you for all the three panelists give a very interesting presentation. I know this is a very exciting topic and we don't have much time. I checked the schedule. Uh, we can extend only five minutes because the other, there's another session followed right away, but in different building. So anybody want to have an exciting question? Go ahead. Make a scenario. Um, you, you don't know have um, you you are in a supply chain context, for instance. Uh, take some food industry, for instance, uh, and there are multiple participants uh, that make sense to have included in a network. So the the, 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 the manufacturing, maybe the farm, even you know where, where part of the the food is produced. Uh, then the transport organizations, um, then the the retailer. Um, maybe a logistics company as well, maybe a food um, uh, auditing company, a certification company. Um, and then in this group, basically, you say, oh, if we all would see what's, what's going to happen, what, what is exactly, what are the steps that basically make up a particular product until it uh, reaches the, the supermarket? Uh, it would help everybody, you know, in recalls and, and provenance and all these kind of things. So now the question is, would you not also need the integration into the production facilities? And I think the, we believe, yes, you have to. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a completely public network. It could still be a permissioned network where you say it's this number, you know, five, ten participants that come together to secure the supply chain. Uh, and some of them are basically in charge of all the production facilities and they, they need to be integrated. Okay. Another question? Okay, if not, I have a question. Okay. Uh, oh, somebody raise hand, I give you priority. Go ahead. Microphone? Well, I mentioned there should be two people around, not just one running. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. I have a question for Zheng Yan. Uh, how did you come up with the number 56 for the fault tolerance of your schema? And uh, uh, how did exactly you can fight the 51% attack? Uh, 
This is referred to our uh, consensus mechanism design. In our paper, maybe you can refer uh, to it uh, offline. And uh, we have proof on our uh, tolerance rate. And uh, we proved that it's 56% higher than other system. And we have a uh, uh, formal proof on this uh, fault tolerance. Yeah. And uh, uh, the consensus mechanism is different from other system. Uh, we in the, trigger the uh, block generation by collecting sufficient uh, information with regard to uh, mobile cross-sourcing behaviors. And uh, uh, during the block, new block generation, we embed uh, trust validation on uh, each involved uh, system, anti uh, system nodes and try to evaluate their trust values based on our designed uh, algorithms. And uh, for uh, designing which uh, block uh, generator is the final winner of next block, we design a new algorithms to uh, select a unique block uh, uh, generator. And uh, ba uh, the, my idea about this selection is based on the trust value of the uh, new block uh, creator, uh, the profit uh, equilibrium, and also the generation time, block generation time. We have a formal proof on uh, the security of our consensus mechanisms by considering four uh, evaluation metrics, as I have mentioned, like uh, liveness, safety, decentralization, and the fault tolerance. Yeah. You can refer to our paper. I um, provide the paper in the slides. Okay. Uh, Trust value is referred to the uh, record uh, uh, stored in the blockchain because uh, every time we generate a block, we conduct a trust evaluation during the generation. It's one processing uh, during block generation. Okay, should be conducted at block generation. And every block is generated and the node trust value is refreshed. Not all of them, um, if we collect uh, related trust uh, data about some node, that node trust uh, value uh, could be up updated, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. yeah. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. Okay. Oh. Hey, microphone. Oh, I have a big voice, so I think that we can ask. <laughs> Very good. Hello? It's a question for Andreas. I, if I me didn't miss <laughs> the, the, your device, the last in the last slide is basically providing a kind of hardware database of the data from the sensor, conceptually, right? So I'm, I'm questioning from the point of view of the industrial application, why you needed the blockchain? You have sensors that are in a trusted environment. You have an hardware database that you are putting at the interface between the internal world of the company and the external one. Why do you need the blockchain technology and not using a more traditional database technology? Mm, yeah, uh, good question. So at the edge, indeed, if you would only look at the edge, you could question, you know, do we really need it? If it would stay within <laughs> trust, you, one trust domain, you know, nobody else can judge on the temperature, for instance, of, of you know, if the sensor is a temperature sensor. No, there's no consensus, you know, you could do because the sensor knows it, nobody else. So why do you need consensus? So what it, the sensors act as oracles to the blockchain system. That, that's the trick. You basically have uh, situations in blockchain systems where two or more parties come together and decide at one point in time, okay, now we agree on certain things. So I pass a coin to you or I have something in the supply chain and it's passed on to some other organization, you know, two transport organizations, for instance. So there you have multiple participants. But at the edge, it's very often like an oracle. It's a bit like uh, you know, weather conditions or a stock price that you take as an input to the transactions. So um, let's take a container. Uh, very often it's important that uh, if you ship something across the world, you know, some perishable goods, that the temperature stays within a cer certain range. So you would have a temperature sensor within the container. So during the shipment, uh, when the thing arrives at the port, you basically would read out all the data points that were collected throughout the journey. 
and you want to read them out in a secure way that nobody can tamper with the results because they may show that the temperature exceeded uh, the, the thresholds. So for this, you need a way of integrating the, this temperature sensor into the blockchain system because it's crucial for liability uh, uh, in the supply chain, for instance, or, or you know, certain quality controls or whatever it is. Uh, but of course, the temperature itself is not a matter to be discussed in the consensus. But still, it's important. It acts like an oracle. Yeah, I, I agree with the gentleman. You, I think uh, in the food processing, we, you know, we need to track the food, the, the production. But later on, this temperature, whatever, seems to be a little bit you know, over argue why we, you need the blockchain system. Well, if, if you buy some food and something's wrong, there are different organizations that would always point to each other and say, it's your fault, it's your fault. Uh, so I think in this case, where you have potentially disputes, it might be a good idea to use blockchain. Mm -hmm. And it is a multiple writer problem because many organizations want to write at the same time into this common shared ledger. Mm -hmm. So I think arguing like this, it would fall into the set of use cases that make sense. I don't want to argue too strong. You have to, you have to be careful. I, you, know, you don't have to use blockchain everywhere. But. Okay. Another question over yeah. there? Yeah, here. Uh, yeah, actually, my question is connected to here. Because here, still, the assumption is whatever comes from the sensor is trusted. Because, if, if, because there is always this problem between off-chain and on-chain. Because the reading, the sensor reading happens off-chain. Then we send the data to be stored in, on, on chain. I don't know if my question is, is clear. Because this integration, you know, I know that whenever I store on, the, on chain, it's safe and secure, and there is a consensus. But if the reading comes already faulty, if someone manipulates the sensor itself, so how, how do you go about this? Correct. Thank so you. So the, the sensor has to be temper proof. Uh, and part of it is the physical temp temper proofness, you know, that nobody can access it and, you know, artificially put a lighter on the, under it so to raise the temperature. But also uh, that nobody can basically uh, sign a similar transaction that would look like it comes from a sensor where it would not come from a sensor. So it has to do with this trusted platform execution. It's like a you know, TPM in this device where you sign. Uh, first of all, you, have, you, you measure basically, you store the values during the, 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 the trip, and then you have a set of data points. And at the point where you read them out, the, basically you probably send a challenge, and then uh, you, you basically send the data points with a challenge using the private key that is only within the secure memory. So with this one, you could trust the, the data points, I would guess. And it's off-chain, you're right. At that yeah. point, it's off-chain. Yeah. OK. Anybody else? Good question? If no, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Holding up. Well, we know in order to use a blockchain, it involves uh, quite a bit resources and a copy duplication and as a consequence the speed is a problem like you talk about the mobile consulting and other things which it really require for build up the trust you need the uh, data large amount of data make sure you say yeah, they have not been tempered and a certain blockchain is very powerful and very useful for that on the other hand, if a blockchain's speed cannot be improved, then will not be applicable to many of the application. What's your opinion on that? If I may start. So I would go back to this picture that I had with the two arrows. On the left-hand side, you would use proof of work, and indeed it's seven transactions per second, so maybe a little bit faster, but, um, and the finality is at least 15 minutes because you have, could have the forks and so on. On the right-hand side, bits and team fault tolerant, is much faster. So the, the, there was just recently a paper for hyperledger fabric where it goes to 23,000 transactions per second. So it's, it's very fast and show me a blockchain application that really needs this, this throughput and I think sub-second finality. So it's always these, these two things. So I think we are by now in the permission context around 100 nodes already in an area where I think it's good to go where it's no longer that we think well, performance is not good. No, it is pretty good, I would think. And it's almost a luxury 
problem to say, give me, give me, you know, to find an application that would need so such a throughput and such a, a low finality. Uh, so I think it's pretty good. And, and the well, certainly the computer technology, due to the continued increase of a processing power as well as the storage, that will improve the speed quite yeah, a bit. The processing power is no on this part is not a problem. It's in the proof of work context. It's a problem because you basically try to find, you know, with, the, with this race for who can commit the next set of transactions, you, 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 you waste a lot of cycles. You, you mm -hmm. just try as much as possible and the first one basically gets the reward. So here you have energy waste and computational expense. On the bits and fault tolerant consensus systems, you don't. Okay. It's computational bound, uh, so uh, yeah, communication bound, uh, but currently understood such that it scales pretty well. Well, certainly that's the challenge. Once we meet the challenge well, then the application to services can be expanded drastically. Any other question? What? Well, if not, then we are uh, on time. And uh, I think you can go to the other session uh, in the other building. We thank you for coming. Thank you for all the three panelists. Give us an exciting talk and a discussion.